Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Beliefs of Islam with me, Hassan Hadi. In today's episode, we will talk about Wahdat al Wujud, the mystical and philosophical word games. Now, one of the problems which prevents any real dialogue and a criticism of the deviated forms of Tawheed which have crept into Muslim scholastic circles is a problem of demarcation, definition, and boundaries. It's commonly known that in advocating and organizing any dialogue and discussion or conversation about any issue in the world that definition is extremely important. In this concern, if definitions were never fixed or agreed upon, then dialogue and discussion would be impossible. Now why is that? The matter is fairly simple. If every time we wish to debate an issue or discuss it in depth, the proposing side could merely redefine the word or term being debated in the first place, then we would experience impossibility in reaching any conclusion and rationality would go down the drain. The proponents of Wahdat al Wujud likewise attempt to employ a very frustrating word game and process of sophistry in which they confuse the innocent believer who wishes to question the concept. They will say that the believer has not studied logic or philosophy for years or that he has not traveled with a mystical shape guiding him upon the varying stages of his spiritual journey. In response to this, we respond that when the Holy Prophet, Allah's blessings and peace be upon him and upon his pure family, came to bring the doctrine of Tawheed to his nation, he did not require that they take a BA, MA, PhD or even an introductory course to the precepts of philosophy. He simply brought them the truth which resonated with their intellects and was simple to understand according to common sense. The proponents of Wahdat al Wujud are hard pressed to define terms and often fluctuate between different terminologies designed to push away criticism. But largely they will opt to define their doctrine under three broad categories namely, pantheism, panentheism, and existential or ontological modalism. Now, in the next episode, we will engage with the most common used definition namely, panentheism. Now, what does the doctrine entail? The doctrine reduces Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to being the one who emanates existence as opposed to the one who creates existence out of nothing. And it teaches in some extreme cases, such as the case of particular heretical individuals, such as Bayezid al-Bastami, who claim that this universe is all but illusory and that nothing exists but God, who claims in his poetry the following, I am I, there is no God but I. So worship me, and glory be to me, how great is my majesty. As opposed to saying Subhanallah, he says Subhani, namely, glory be to me. He goes on saying, the obedience to me is greater than my obedience to thee. I am the throne and the footstool. By my life, my grasp is firmer than his. I saw the Kaaba walking round me. Moses desired to see God. I do not desire to see God. He desires to see me. This is also seen in the heretical claims of another of the proponents of Wahdat al Wujud, namely Mansur al Hallaj, a man who went around the Muslim world saying an al Haq, namely, I am the reality, I am God, due to his belief that nothing existed but God Himself. Hallaj is often praised as a great mystic by some, but what did the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, Allah's blessings and peace be upon them all, say of him? It's been reported in the books of occultation dealing with the history of the Ghaybah when Allah desired to unveil the affair of the Halaj and manifest his humiliation and to disgrace him, he thought that Abu Sahal ibn Ismail ibn Ali and Nabakhti, may Allah be pleased with him, was a person that could be deceived by his hawks and taken by his fraud. So he sent after him. Because of his sheer ignorance, he assumed that Abu Sahel is like the other weaklings in the matter of faith, I reckon that he could be drawn and tricked through his lunacies, and that by commanding Abu Sahel's loyalty, he will be able to draw yet more followers on the virtue of Abu Sahel's position in the eyes of the people and his respectability in knowledge and literature. al halaj sent to him the following, I am the representative of the patron of the age, meaning Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, May Allah hasten his reappearance. Through such a message, he would first draw the ignorant people and then proceed to other claims. He stated, I have been ordered to correspond with you and avail you with the help you desire, so your soul may find strength and you may not have doubts in the creed. This demonstrates that not only did Al Halaj become condemned by the greatest scholars of Islam and the representatives of the Shia community, but that he also claimed to be direct special representative of the Imam of our time, an entirely false claim. 
It also reminds us of the necessity of taking knowledge from a trustworthy source. Now the question is, do we want to take our Akida from a man denounced and condemned by the greatest of scholars? It has been narrated in Al-Kafi from Imam Abu Ja'far al-Baqar, Allah's blessings and peace be upon him, who has said the following. Be aware of thinking about Allah's self. If you would like to think about the greatness of Allah, think about his great and wonderful creations. This was for today. Until we meet next episode, thank you very much indeed. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.